we do have a guest. We're, we have a guest now, today. Took a little break off that. We're just answering you guys' questions, just trying to give you guys some motivation and understand where I'm coming from. Trying to uh, push some of, my, some of the things that I'm working on right now. There he is. Morning, Andrew. How are you, son? Good. How are you? Uh, let me know when you change your shirt. <laughs> and I'll, uh, Victoria, was... Victoria's going to go get my Manchester United shirt. <laughs> I, um, I was putting on my, uh, I was putting on my shirt for this and I found it in my suitcase and I said, that would be perfect. That would be perfect. <laughs> yeah, there we go. But, that's but um, that's right. yeah. But, when was the last um, time you wore that? I wear it every day to bed. <laughs> no, but um, no, I tell everyone on here, I tell them, you know, Arsenal's my team. I love them, but wouldn't really recommend them to watch video right now. Leave a Zoom meeting. Leave a Zoom meeting. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, obviously you've been on here before. Yeah. Someone, there were, there were a couple of questions. There were a couple of questions that came in. Number one. Um, who are some of the players that you've coached that have made it onto the next level? I told them to wait. It's it's a good list. It's a solid, solid, yeah. pretty long list. So, just a, a few of the names that you've you've coached and have been successful. I think the one I had the most influence was Eddie Johnson because uh, you know I coached him on his club team quite a bit. The head coach of the of Eddie, um, Bob Sawyer, really did a lot for him. You know, mm -hmm. he was in a bad part of Florida and he was in that gang and uh, he took him under his wing and um, he was the main person. But in terms of coaching, I, I saw Eddie in a Sun Bowl at age 12 score a magnificent goal and then I started yeah. coaching him. So for about three years, I was involved with him before he left for Bradenton yeah. with the under-17 team. So I think that because I spent more time with him, yeah, I've coached others at regional level and... Obviously, I've been in uh, two World Cups at under-17 yeah. level. But in terms of getting people to that level, Eddie would be the one that um, helped Nathan Sturgis a little bit because he was St. Augustine and then he mm -hmm. went to Clemson and then got drafted MLS, played at under-20 national team. Yeah. Uh, helped him a bit because, you know, we used to go to Treaty Park, if you remember there. Right? Yeah, yeah, of course. We lived and uh, worked on a little bit this and that and, uh, so perhaps him as well. And then others, it was more taking them abroad, taking them, you yeah. know, obviously I've been in, when I was with US soccer, I was fortunate that they, when they were in Bradenton, it was a time of Donovan and Beasley. So sometimes Coach Ellinger would say, I'm going for a week. Would you take over the team? I'd stay there for a week and be able to coach the Donovans, Beasleys, Beckham yeah. of this world just over a week. And then I went with them to Dallas Cup and one or two bits and pieces there as the assistant coach. So, suppose a little bit of influence there, but main, main influence was probably Eddie, I would have thought. Yeah, and I mean, like I said last time, I think for me as a coach, learning from you is treating the worst player on the team with the same amount of respect and understanding as I treat the best player on the team. There are a lot of coaches that I, I've been around that I know of who focus on the, the best player or even they didn't really coach the best player. They, was, they were like an assistant coach somewhere and they said, Oh yeah, you know, um, you know, who some big time player in the MLS or went abroad, and they're like, yeah, I I coached him or whatever. Yeah, you coached him for one training session, and I, and I think it yeah. shows. I think it. I mean, obviously, you know, coaches like that. But yeah, yeah. It, I I look at that and I say, what are you actually in this for? Are you in this for the notoriety? Are you in this to help a kid and help change a life? Like, yeah, it, now, it, I would agree with that, Andrew. In terms of uh, there are coaches. You know, we went to Sheffield Wednesday for a little right. bit with you, obviously. I've known some people to do that. And then on the resume, guest coach of this club. Well, yeah, you watch the session and you talk to the right. coach. You weren't a guest. You, you know, you just happened to observe training. Yeah. Was great. But no need to put it on your resume that you went here, went there. And um, uh, so, yeah, yeah. Sometimes coaches do it for their own satisfaction in terms of 
trying right. to get on and get on. The satisfaction, I think, comes from a coach who's working with all the players and improving all the players. We've got exactly. some boys at Shadow that weren't as good when they started, but they've made major improvements. They're not as good as some of the best players, but the improvement they've made is better than some of the best players because you've treated them well, you've given them opportunities, and you believe in them, and you see them day in and day out, and it's important that they develop as well as the best players. I mean, now, I, I think might be a little I, bit I, harder. I'm a little bit harder, possibly. Oh, of course, of course. On the better players because they can do a bit more. Where sometimes you can't ask some of the players who aren't quite as good to do certain things. But you're That's catering. You're course. catering to each and yeah. every person's needs. I mean, the, obviously, right. the older play, the better player. You can't you can't treat them like a, a lesser player, but the, with that respect, with that understanding right. that right. hey, this kid, this kid doesn't want to be a pro. He just wants to get into college. And you look at him and say, hey, how, how are your studies going? How's your family? Right. You know, with the, with the other player who, you know, eat, eat, sleep, breathe soccer, you're talking, hey, did you see a Liverpool game? Hey, did you, yeah. you know, um, how was training today? All this stuff. So, but, I mean, that's something I've learned is obviously at Shattuck especially, we look at the Mark Browns, we look at the, the Finn O'Neills at one point, mm. and we say – we take almost more pride in that than we do, you know, myself, Ricky Lopez, these guys who are obviously doing well. Yeah. So it's like, I think I've learned that, that, you know, you're only, you're only at, in a soccer sense, you're only as good as your weakest link. Yeah. So if you put, if you put in the time and the effort into your weakest link, your team's going to be better, but yeah. it's also, it's also catering to the person. And like I talked with DJ, catering to the person rather than the player. Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, you talk about Finn. I mean, he's a success story because he actually, we weren't sure when we first saw him. And he was so, he so wanted to come that he came back for a sort of second tryout, if you will. And yeah. Said, oh, can I show you again, coach? And, you know, and I was just enamored with his passion and wanting to do it. And uh, and then we said yes. And then he continued to improve. Uh, yeah. Ian Smith's another guy that came and, you know, when Akeem got injured, he was on nine, wasn't really scoring any goals. But the next year and the next year after that, you know, both those boys played collegiate soccer, which is exactly. just Crazy. terrific, you know. But when they first came, we weren't sure, but we, we worked with them. And, you know, yeah. they, they had good qualities, good people, good kids, went to college and, and, and eventually played there at some level. So that's just as a reward as getting someone to the pros in a way. I mean, I've definitely, through this quarantine and through this time, I've really tried to become like a better person rather than just a better player. How much do you as a coach who's been around, how, how much do you put into the person? Like when I'm scouting a player, obviously you see talent, you see that stuff. But when you're talking to him, how much do you put into, is he a good guy? Does yeah. he work hard over maybe someone who's more talented? Yeah, no, it's, it's a good point. I mean, there's been one or two boys. Uh, I'm sitting here, the community period near where, where I live. There've been one or two boys who've been I've said no to when they've been here during a prospect weekend or a camp, and their attitude yeah. towards other kids, for instance, and uh, not being on time when we meet for question time, and right. you know helping move the stuff to the van, you know, and all that right. kind of stuff. And um, it is important, um, you know, when I go and scout a game, I like to get there a bit early to see how they warm up. I'm big on seeing their reaction when the coach is talking to them at half time. Are they paying attention are they messing around yeah. you know uh, how are they when we're two or three down and what's their attitude that i exactly. love to see a boy coming off the field how is he reacting does he welcome the sub to replace him or is he a bit you know upset and with the coach yeah. oh, why'd you take me off type coach uh, i can't believe it type thing you know so it's not just the 90 minutes on the field it's half right. time have to get i like to walk with the boy and just see him how he's going to react to his parents and off the field with other players following a loss, a win. Yeah, no, I, 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 a lot of store by that because you get to see a little bit about the kid. Um, we, we have a boy actually here at Shattuck. I'll never forget, um, I wasn't sure that we should bring him in. It was, it was an injury. And yeah. um, so restart of play, he should have kicked it out. You know, the throw yeah. to him, kick it out or give it to the other team. But he just got the ball and started dribbling and, you know, and I thought, oh, okay. That's, um, you know, that, that stuck with me a little bit. Um, right. And actually, I've reminded him of that a couple of times this season because his attitude towards teammates 
hasn't actually been as good as it should be. Yeah. Um, but he is improving as a player. And, yeah. and that's the other thing. You know, you've got some people who've got some faults. Well, let's work with them to right. uh, to help them. No one's perfect. And um, But yeah, in the scouting and evaluating, it's all important, not just what they do yeah. with the ball. I mean, there's a lot There's a lot to that. And obviously, when I was younger, you know, growing up with a coach as a dad, like, you always told me, you don't know who's watching. Make sure you're doing the right things. You know, the warm-up's important because, you know, coaches watch that stuff. Yeah. And obviously, as a kid, like, I did those things. I really believe I did those things properly. But in my head, I was just like, okay, whatever. No one's, no one's watching tra- uh, uh, warm-up. Like, you look over and you see people not watching. But yeah. – you never know that one time when not necessarily you you make it because you had a good warm up but you don't lose it cuz you had a good warm up right. like right. like the warm up's not necessarily going to be like oh he warms up really well i am going to sign him or something like that but it is oh his warm up's not very good i don't think i'm going to sign him i don't think i i wonder what he's like in the in the locker room in the changing room which is the more and more i grow up the changing room is the most important thing you always hear him oh he lost the changing room and that's when they get sacked. But um, so there's that. And anyone who's watching the younger kids, like, make sure you're doing the right things always. Make sure, you know, you're warming up like you need to warm up in order to get ready for the games. It's not a, it's not a joke. Training, I've talked about it many times. It's not a joke. It's a, it's a time for you to warm up. It's a time for you to warm up and get ready for the game. So, so doing that, making sure that you're a good teammate, like you said with the, the kid. I mean, obviously he's young, so – but – you know, how you treat your teammates is how, you know, the team performs. And, you know, I've been critical of teammates before um, when I was younger and stuff like that. Now I'm more critical in terms of like trying to raise up the level. Um, my coach in Germany had to talk to me about, Hey, don't be so hard on these, these guys. I'm just like, well, we want to win. We want to win. So figuring out how to talk to your teammates is huge because coaches see that as well, where they, they want a player who talks a lot, but who talks constructively and with purpose, not just, hey, what are you doing? What are you doing? Well, he's trying to win. He's trying to do well, just like you. So when you're talking, being constructive and saying, hey, next time you need to go here, you need to do this, or talking to the guy in front of you. Um, but, yeah, and then, I mean, it's just – for younger kids, that's just the, the the biggest thing. And I was lucky enough to have a coach as a, as a dad, so – I actually heard you talk about other players or like kids on the 18s who didn't have the right attitude and how they acted and you would talk about them. And I'd be like, okay, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be the guy who is a problem. And <clears throat> I mean, that really helped me in college. I talked about it yesterday to them <clears throat> about not playing in college in junior, uh, my junior year, my half a senior year and how, um talking to my talking to um gil the other day how they thought i was going to leave they wanted they thought i was going to leave and they thought i was going to be a problem but instead i came back and i was a better teammate i supported my my teammates to win to do well because in the end that helps me that helps me do well but um but yeah so um what do you what do you say to someone who is the best player on the team who looks at their teammates and they say, we lost the game because our center backs are horrible or my right back is horrible or my goalkeeper sucks. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny going back to Eddie Johnson, you know, when we had him in the club, um, he always got better, but I always felt he was much, he really got better when he went to Bradenton because he yeah. was playing with kids as good as him, as fast as him. And he was a little bit, uh, like that at times, not blaming. He was friendly with the other boys, but, you know, he, he got a little bit angry with them, but they weren't at yeah. his level. It was still a very good team. They all went right. to college and beyond. But, um, you know, uh, at the end of the day, you know, the better players, and to be fair to him, you know, we tried to challenge him. There was no real other team in the club that he could go and play in. It had right. to be an age group. It was a very small club in Palm Coast. And, um, you know, he... he, he um, Got more competition when he left for Bradenton. But at that time, you know, um, you had to talk to him a little bit about understanding that just because he's the best player, and he certainly was, when, yeah. he made, when he made mistakes, which he did, you know, other players, coaches weren't getting on him because he was the best player. So 
yes, you're getting on other people's mistakes and they're not as good as you, but don't forget, you've made mistakes. You want to get yeah. on. And if you, like you said at the beginning, if you want the team to do well, try and help these kids rather than be negative towards them because the team will benefit as a result if you're positive. Just imagine as the best player uh, and you're being positive with the boys and your understanding of them a little bit. Yeah. It's not easy for a 13, 14-year-old boy. Right, I think, yeah, that's yeah. what I was about to say is I think that's, yeah. I think that's really difficult for yeah. Yeah. a teenager to be like, yeah. like, especially when you're playing against your friends. Like, I mean, in Georgia, we, we go to ODP and we come back and with our teams, and now we're playing against our ODP teammates, yeah. and we lose 4-1. Four, four we lose 5-0 five, five to another team. And I might be right that it wasn't me and DJ's fault. It was someone else's fault. So you're going through that. And in order to – I mean, it takes a lot of maturity to say, hey, guys, like, let's raise the level and do that in a positive way rather than just saying, dude, you suck. You're, you're horrible and all this stuff. And so – that's why, I mean, obviously on here, I try to give as much practical advice, but I mean, just, just try that. Just try creating a relationship where it is like, if you're already losing five nil, the best thing, I mean, you, if you're going to give up, then just don't play the rest of the time. Tell your coach you want to come off. But if you're going to play fight, get your teammates around you and say, Hey, we have nothing to lose right now. Let's just go, let's just go after this and try to be a team. And I think that takes a ton of maturity. And I think that will take a lot of kids to the next level. And coaches will see that, like we were talking about. Yeah, I think for the younger kids, um, it does sort of start with the coach as well. Because if the coach is positive with the other players, no matter what the score is. And at the end of the day, at 13-14, the score's not that important. You know, if a better team comes and be, you know, okay, it's it's not, we're not trying to win every game. We're really right. seeing where they are and how they're progressing and getting them to the next level. Yeah. And you're going to lose yeah. quite a bit. Um, that was a good clip you put on about Van Persie, you know, um, uh, about his son, you know, yeah. he didn't yeah. play, and, you know, and he's saying, you know, you're going to lose a lot in these games. I'm still going to love you as a, as a dad, but you know, you've got to change your attitude. You can't be blaming right. the coach. You can't be. And I know as a player, I went through that a little bit. I remember when a, uh, I was on the bench in Fort Lauderdale and, inwardly to myself I was moaning at the guy that was probably in my place right oh, look at him I could have done better then I can't believe he's picked very natural when... he's just giving the ball away you know yeah. really that's not very good because at the end of the day if you're on the bench and you're not doing so you know the team's not doing... and then you get your chance to play you've got to be in the right frame of mind and if you've been criticizing criticizing other players and inwardly being negative yeah. now it's your chance to go on the field you're not ready you should be excited pumped right i'm on the field now not moaning that you didn't yeah. see the field for the first hour you've come on for the last half hour make the most of it and if your mind is not ready and you're moaning and whining and i could do better well at the end of the day be positive so that when your chance to show the coach you can do better you take full advantage of it right for sure i want to switch switch gears right now from player to coach yeah. um for, for me this is just me asking a question because i was thinking about this the other day I was obviously coaching the U17 team in Germany. Mm -hmm. I worked with them heavily on simple, I was just working first on goal kicks. I was working on them spreading out, giving each other space mm -hmm. rather than everyone checking to the ball. We worked on it, some great moments where they executed it perfectly in the games that we played. Other times, that's the reason we lost. We lost 3-2 that one game because our goalkeeper tried to dink it. Because I tried to get him to play it into the forward's chest. Center back, center mids get out of the way. He dinks it into the chest. And the space was on. He just mishit it, went to the player, came in. Mm -hmm. I say that as an example because I think, obviously, at the highest level, coaches don't get any time to work with, like, in the, in the Prem, in La Liga, whatever. They expect results immediately. As a, as a youth coach, as a college coach, how long or how – much time is a good amount of time to say, I want to implement all this stuff, all this new stuff that you're not already doing. How long do you think it should be before you start seeing results? Uh, well, that's hard. You know, um, I kind of like the fact that, you know, youth level, uh, and we're sort of doing it right now with our teams. It's easy to say, I got a game Saturday, you know, and from the game before, we need to fix this, 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 and this. Yeah. But actually, just spending, a week or two on playing out of the back. Uh -huh. you know, 
your two and three's high, your four and five wide, and where's your six, and how yeah. eight's going to get free, and 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 if you're going to go long, let's get the centre forward, not in the middle because they can come right back, but let's go right. wide, and, and perhaps pack that wide area, and it shouldn't be right. I did it for one session, and now let's move on to something else. But spend a couple of weeks on yeah, building yeah. The back, limited pressure, full pressure, and just making sure they're good at that because they won't get much practice in the game. You know, they, they will in a game, but they'll do some of that, but it's just not enough. So I think in practice, rather than going, you know, every week, well, what do we do poorly? And again, I'm talking more at youth level. Yeah. We, there's a lot of things you did poorly. The middle third, going into the final third. So what do you attack first? And, and rather than trying to cram it all in one week, spend a couple of weeks and say, I know we're not grading the final third, but I'm not going to talk about that this week. I'm yeah. really going to work on getting into midfield, getting a full back wide and further forward yeah. you know, and see how the defenders adjust to where, you know, as he goes, is a six sitting a little bit or make sure the two tucks in as another, another six from the other side and, and just working on the shape of that and playing that and spending the couple of weeks rather than, yeah, right. I did it for practice. It should be brilliant on Saturday. Well, it won't be, you know. I mean, yeah. you could do finishing for one session. I did finishing Thursday, Friday. Why aren't they? It's got to be, you know, a couple of weeks or so to right. work on different runs and different crosses. And so whatever you're doing, and again, at the youth level, you're not trying to say, I've got to do everything to get a result on Saturday. I've got to get them better in all departments. And we're going to spend two weeks on working out the back. And, and, make, and then on Saturday... The kids will know what you're gonna, what he's expecting from you, right, guys. Exactly. Let's put into practice what we did out of the back. That's how I'm going to judge you today. That we put into practice in a game situation, rather than worrying about moving into the final third. Our shots on goal, our crosses were poor. That's our goal for this Saturday. Let's get in the midfield, working out the back. Let's make sure our two and threes are comfortable on the ball and wide. And positionally, we're sound, and uh, yeah. and that could be the theme for the week. And the theme on Saturday. And you might lose 4-2. But you know what? You're satisfied with how you got into the middle third most yeah. of the time. And, and then that's a good building block to move on. Do it a bit more. And you can't forget that. You then come back and then right, and, right. Uh, work on that again. Because you can't just say, well, I did it for a week or two. Uh, check that box. Like, you know, so there are certain important things that tactically you've got to get right. And you can't just work on three or four things in a week and expect right. everything to be right. Saturday. It's, it takes some time. Right. So, I mean, there was a lot there, but for me, I was just thinking about like, if I was a player in that system, like I remember coach Carter, we did literally a full month of just defending. We got the ball out right at the end, but we would just do defending, moving shape. Then we'd add the two sixes and then we'd add the wide mids and the center mid. And we'd literally just do shape work for a month. And I remember John going in and saying, coach, like, I think we need to get the ball out a little bit or whatever. And coach is like, hey, listen, I, I, I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. But we were all like, hey, are we ever going to, like, do some shooting? Are we ever going to, like, play a game or whatever? We did that for a full month, five days a week, full month. And we were like, what are we going to do? Let in the least amount of goals in the, in, the, in the country at the time. I mean, there was a reason why we did it. We ended up making it to the final. Or we ended up going to the playoffs for the first time, stuff like that. But – my, but my question is, in those moments, as a player, when you are losing two, three games on the trot because you're working on something new, what do you say to a player, like, in terms of trust your coach? Because there are, because truth be told, there are coaches out there that you probably should not trust. There are coaches out there who don't know what they're doing. So how do you say, hey, just trust your coach? As, or as a parent, how do you say, hey? Just trust your coach. He knows what he's doing. He'll figure it out or you'll figure it out. Well, yeah, I mean, that coach has got to get the respect of his players. <clears throat> you know, people well, say to me, you know, they call me coach and I, you know, you, you, you call me Bobby, you call me, because, why do you call me coach? Well, it's yeah. respect, coach. Well, I've got to earn your respect. You yeah. know, you could call me coach, but inwardly thinking, you know, he's not that good or he's poor, or, right. but I'm still going to call him coach because it's yeah. respect. But I've got to earn the respect. And I think, you know, again, I think it's the qualities of the coach, caring for the players. Uh, and again, I would always say you've got to make it enjoyable. Yeah. That's the other thing is, all right, so for a month you did all this stuff. Could there have been a day you went and just played and did a bit of futsal and let's yeah. play. 
let's play. And, and of course, the games are playing on a Saturday. Uh, but for those subs that never get to play much, you know, yeah. when are they playing rather than drills, drills, drills? There's got to be some playing in the practice. There's got to be some enjoyment through the playing. But I think the older coaches who do the test of time and been around a lot of players can get that respect, you know, by the way they do it because they're experienced. For the younger coach, he's got to care about the players. For he's sure. got to be shown that he's for the players, yeah. that he works for them, that he enjoys them, that he's honest. That he, and I think that's a key. Are you honest with the players? Right. Are you trying to improve the players? Are you they they know. They, even if they're young, they know. They know yeah. whether you whether you're you're being genuine or you're just trying to. If I'm a good player, you're just trying to use me to get your notoriety. Or if I'm a if I'm not a, as good of a player, you're just you're just doing this because you you know you want me to feel good or whatever. So I mean, kid, people know. Kids know. Yeah. I know whether or not a coach right. is being genuine. So you, yeah. as a coach, you have to be genuine. Like we said many times, player over – or um, person over player, making sure you, that the person is taken care of. So Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, you know, when I – looking at my 10 years at, at Shattuck, the worst record year was the first year of the under-14s. We just got from January to August, we got 20 players. Some were better than others, but we just had to fill a team. Yeah. And record-wise, very poor. Yeah, but actually, as I analysed the year at the end, one of my better years of coaching. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll tell you one reason why. When we went to the showcase in June, and we actually won a couple of games, and you know we hadn't won much at all leading into it. Yeah, the boys there after ten months, basically September. Now we're in June. Worked ever so hard and pushed themselves, even though looking at our record. You could say, "Oh my goodness, look at them there!" Right, right. Two and fifteen going into the, you know, wow, you know. But the boys just kept going. They believed in what we were doing, and the biggest thing is that they worked hard and tried to do yeah. their best. And I thought they're doing that at the end of the season, which is a very poor season to of records. Some of them are a bit out of their depth, but we still kept plugging away, plugging away. We yeah. won halves. We were one nothing up at half time, and then the other teams might bring in their two best players, and boom. 4-1, we lost, but we were one up at half. So we sort right. of looked at success. And, all right, we didn't win over 80 minutes, but for 40 minutes, we held our own. Right. And the positives, the positives from every game. Yeah, yeah. We're 2 nothing down, we come back, and, and, and we 2-1. And all right, yeah. we won the second half, we didn't win the game, but the, yeah. there are good building blocks that you can be positive with the kids and say, we didn't win the game, but there's improvement. Yeah. And I think as the coach is taking charge of that way of thinking and, and helping the players that way, like you say, the boys know that we're in their corner. We're trying our best to get them better. We're not having a go at them all the time. We're trying to still make it enjoyable. And um, I think sometimes, as I say, you can get a bit more from a team that maybe had a poor record, where a right. team with a very good record had a great players to start. Would another coach have done the same thing? Or did the coach influence them? But I really felt that at the end of that year, they were still trying their best, pushing. Yeah. They were better players than September when we were um, in June the next year at the showcase. And I felt good about it. But record-wise, you'd say, wow, you know, that was a poor record, coach. Uh, but those boys moved on and got better. Yeah. And, um, and, and, and I thought that was a decent year. I mean, when, obviously, when I look back to when I was a kid, when I was in Shattuck, a little bit in college, when new kids would come in, I, I think that I have a good idea of like, hey, this kid's down. Make sure you pick him up now. Or he he thinks he's all that in a bag of chips. Bring him down a little bit. And I think I think now, obviously, I use that for good. Like I can, when I'm coaching, when I'm playing, I can see players. And I'm like, come on, let's like, let's go, let's go. It's not necessarily like, hey, you're you're a great player. Pick it up. But it's like, hey, let's go, let's go. Or, hey, what are you doing? Pass it to me. Pass it. So like whether I need to get on them or whether I need to lift them up. I, I know. But as a coach, when do you think, you know, obviously it's, it's pretty similar when the, when we just got beat five nil, whether the team is good or not depends probably whether on whether or not I give them, you know, a few choice words, or if I say, Hey guys, it's okay. We'll get them. We'll get them on Monday or whatever. We'll get back at it on Monday and we'll go again. So, yeah. So you have that. And then also you said that the team, you know, in at the end of the season 
for the showcase, you were able to push them. Obviously, it wasn't a team that was super athletic, super skilled, um, all these things. But at some point, you realize that, hey, they're, they're coming together. Even if we're losing all these games, we're coming together. Now I can push them a little bit harder. Like I was saying with Coach Carter, with, you know, doing a lot of defending, he saw that we had a group that some of us had played 18, some of us had played 16. We needed to gel. But he saw that all of our goals were to get to the playoffs, get to the playoffs again. Because the year before, obviously, we made it to the playoffs, didn't do that well. You guys missed out barely. And he knew that we were coming in hungry, so he knew he could push us. When do you know, as a coach, like, hey, now I can start pushing them. Like, we were doing 13, 17s every Tuesday. Hard, hard work. You can't do that with every team. Like, you can't put them on the line every single, every Tuesday. Hard, hard work in the rain, in the snow, and push them. So when do you when as, when do you as a coach know? Hey, it's time to push them a little bit harder, or lay off. Yeah. Well, you know, after after games, obviously, uh, first of all, as a coach, you don't want to react right away. You know, you want to right. sleep yeah. on it. You you won't forget things. The players won't forget the next time you meet. Um, and sometimes when you've had poor results, you want to have a hand around them on their shoulder. Yeah. And you know, yeah. in fact, I was, you know, sometimes when you've won, so the boys are reasonably happy, right. that would be a good time the next practice to start pointing out certain things that they didn't yeah. do so well because they are good enough to win even though they don't, you know, we're always saying to the kids, will that work against the MLS teams? Will that work right. in the playoff? We're in the playoff. To do well, and Coach Boucher actually in our club is always saying, we're pushing to play FC Dallas. We want to beat exactly. and play FC Dallas. This might work against this team, but for good players who've got a chance to go far, it's not going to work against FC Dallas. So sometimes, even in a win, the better they are, yes, we're all happy with a win, fair enough. But ne next time you meet, you can be a bit more critical of them. Right. Where the team that's lost and perhaps not done as well because they haven't quite got the talent, just moaning at them and saying we're losers and we should do better. To, you know, I they think, need, I, they I, need I th help. Sorry to cut you off. I think that's, yeah. that's huge because... It's not, it's not looking at another team saying, hey, look how good they are. Look what they're doing and all this stuff. I should be, we should be doing that here and all this. But it's looking at the standard. Obviously, FC Dallas is the standard when it comes to youth academies. And looking at the standard, taking a peek at them. Oh, the standard's up here. I'm right here. Okay, let's go back to work. It's not focusing on FC Dallas. Oh, they're doing this drill. We need to do this drill. We need to do this. But know that when we play them, we need to be – firing on all cylinders because we believe that our game plan is better. That's why we're doing it. But we need to be able to execute that against the, the lowest club, the best club. Like the year that we went to the final, we tied Vardar. They only brought 12 players to the game. We were obviously way better. I, I, uh, I helped out with a goal in that game, but we tied them 2-2 against the team who – was nowhere near as good as us who only brought 12 players and we tied them because we weren't on, we weren't firing on the level that we should be every single game. We came back and we won a few games after that. So, I mean, so that's why I'm curious about when, when, like you said, it could be after a win that you push them. It could be after a loss. I mean, we always, me and you always talk about when your team played my team, the 16s played the 18s, uh, John Lohano was injured and we, there was nine one or something like that. I scored a penalty. Easy, so and... one, one easy. Don't get carried. What away. was it? Four nothing, I think. Oh, go it was on. not never, four nothing. Never nine. Uh, I, I chipped in. I chipped in. I chipped in with a pen from from the left back position, and um, well, actually, you, you were eighteen yards away. You weren't at left back, but go on. You were twelve, 12 yards. Twelve yards. Twelve yards. Yeah. 12 yards, sorry, you but started saying, eighteen but... and. Yeah, but uh. But obviously you saw that as a moment, like, hey, wasn't good enough. And yeah. I and talking about it, I think and yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that comes from knowing the standard of your team. You know these players, you know them as people, you know them in the classroom. In the classroom they give hundred and ten percent. Right. Typically, normally in, in game or in training and in, in soccer they give a hundred and ten percent. Today they didn't give hundred and ten percent. There's no way we're four nil worse than the eighteen. Right. 
Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, there was a bit too much respect, number one. Number two, their heads went down when one or two goals went in, and that disappointed me because, like you say, no matter what the score is, no matter winning yeah. four nothing, losing four nothing, you still try your best and you keep mm -hmm. going. And I thought this team had a belief about themselves that they would keep going, and I was a bit disappointed yeah. to see that they didn't give up necessarily, but, you know, they were very tentative and, you know, and, and then showed too much respect, right. uh, which enabled you just to stroll through us most of the time. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, so when I think about it, like, I always respect the opponent. Like, yeah. I, I, you know, I got in trouble for this a couple of times at Atlanta United, too, when we would play the first team, showing, you know, Darlington Nagby a little bit too much respect. Like, mm -hmm. oh, he, like, I've seen him in games. I've seen him at Mercedes-Benz. I've seen him. So now I'm coming up against them. I'm giving him a little bit too much respect. Miguel Amaron, a little bit too much respect. Right. So finding that balance of respect your opponent, but also yeah. make sure that they know that you're there. Make sure that they have to respect you. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, take advantage of those opportunities. Absolutely. Exactly. And enjoy it and do your best and then challenge them to be better. And um, then they have to respond to, uh, in a similar way. Um, but I know when you play the first team, that's terrific. But you're right. Yeah, yeah. It's easy to say, well, they're on the first team, they're this, they're that. But um, not easy to say, well, I'll, uh, I'm going to do as best as I can because I think I can get an advantage over them, etc. It is tough when you're playing those kind of players, but you'll get more respect from the head coach of the first team when he sees you, you know, putting 100% in at least. Yeah. Putting 100%. That's the key. Um, someone asked a question. Ramos asked a question. I asked this already, but what, what for you... He asked me, but what for you, what is the difference between, you know, Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three, NAIA? What is the difference? Yeah, um, not a lot, to be fair. Now, the top Division Ones are the best. But right. there's over 300 Division One programs in this country and good Division Twos and Threes and certainly NAIA, um, which doesn't have quite the age restrictions that the NCAA programs have, can be as competitive without a doubt. Yeah. Um, there's very good coaches in the NAIA, Division Three, Division II, uh, the scholarships, there's, you know, there's facilities as good. Now the top players will go to the better Division I schools that, you know, have produced pros in the past. But, uh, so Division One is clearly the best. But once right. you get past the best, maybe 30, 35 Division I teams, yeah. then I can, I can name quite a few Division Two teams that can compete with 40th yeah. best Division One team, and and could get into the top 50 Division One. Same with Division Three and NAIA, without a doubt. The, the difference is NAIA, and I was uh, a coach of an NAI college and a Division One college, and, mm -hmm. and it's clearly this: it's the amount of students you have in the school, yeah. and most importantly, how many sports you offer. Yeah. So at Flagler, when I coached at Flagler, we only offered a certain number of sports. We didn't have enough sports to go Division One or two. Yeah. Since they added a few more sports, they went Division Two. So it's just a question of I'm going NAIA because we don't offer football and you know field hockey and volleyball right. and all that stuff. We only offer a handful of sports. Therefore, we can't be Division One. Doesn't mean a coach is now going to say, "Oh, I'm just going to recruit inferior players." He's going to try and recruit some of the best players. I was looking yeah. at some of my early teams at Flagler, and I got some of the best players in the state come to Flagler. They were very good. You know, your Greg yeah, Bricks, right. your Sean Murphy, your Kenny Higgins, your Ricky Von Gobers. I'm talking about Florida boys who came to Flagler, Glenn Hughes, um, you know, who could have gone to bigger and better Division Ones, Division Twos, but they came to Flagler yeah. uh, as I recruited them and we did well. And then when we played Division Two teams, we did very well. When we played Division One teams in the state, we did very well as well. So, yeah. but, you know, there's a pecking order. Obviously, the best Division 1s right. are better than the best Division 2s and 3s. But you can still see and find very good NEIA Division 3, Division 2 programs that could compete with a lot of Division 1s. Yeah. Um, Charles from the Netherlands said, yeah. do you think it is a good idea to go to college and play soccer, considering you're from the outside of the U.S.? I don't know what the alternative would be for him, but would you recommend that kids from Europe from anywhere in the world, go to college? Well, I think, you know, and I got a few boys, uh, mainly from England, and uh, seven or eight excellent boys from Iceland who did very, very well. And I think uh, f 
for those individuals abroad, if education is part of their makeup, you know, they want to go to right. college. Now, most times you go to college in all these other countries and the athletics is not as good. It's just club soccer and, and you know, uh, but if they want to combine education with a good level of playing soccer, right. then I would probably suggest coming over to this country to try and uh, play for your four years and get a good college education and you'll still be a good player. And then maybe you stay in this country and try and make the MLS. Uh, right the road which which you're able to do so yes yeah, if you right. don't go pro at 16 17 18 in the netherlands or any other foreign country then it's a very viable just like here now some of the best players do go straight to the pros and miss right. out on college at 18 years of age i would say the same for the for the people abroad from someone from netherlands and and, and i've seen some good dutch players in the past uh come over here not as many as maybe other countries but if you've done well in academically and you know the language well, yeah, uh, I think it's a wonderful opportunity and a very good idea to come over here, get your four years of, of college education and enjoy a very good level of soccer. Uh, the facilities are good. The coaching is good. The only problem is we don't play as many games as we should. Right. And it's just over a three-month season. What do you do with the rest of the time? So there are certain things about that that you might think aren't as good. But in terms of the college season itself, the standard is good. Uh, you get your education. So absolutely, I think it would be worthy, worthwhile for him to try and see if he can play in this country if he's not going professional. Right. And, and, I, think, and I think with that is like, I think it's a great opportunity, obviously, to play. But I think, um, but I think it's a great opportunity, obviously, for soccer. But I think it's a great opportunity just in general to come to America when you're not playing in your three months, obviously it would be great if it was eight months, like a normal season. But I think that it would be a great opportunity to meet people in business, meet people in art. Like just, you get to, college is a place, you know, obviously I was 100% focused on soccer. So I really didn't take advantage of it that much from an other standpoint, but it is a great place to meet and connect with people. And basically, you know, if you can get a scholarship for it, you're getting your you're getting your school paid for while you're there taking classes. I mean, it, it's it's a good it's a good um it's a good uh, idea. I think if if you're not going professional in your home country, I saw a question there about someone saying are the scholarships reduced? Yeah. Are there as many scholarships? Well, you know, you can get other scholarships as well. Yeah. You know, academic scholarships. If your grades are very good, it can be part of the package. Yes, you mm -hmm. probably can't get financial aid from another country, obviously, but. But, you know, it's mainly soccer, but maybe you can get some academic money um, or you can earn some more money. Um, so, yes, maybe there's not as many, but there's still enough in most schools that if you're good players, most of the foreign players that come over get pretty good soccer packages. Yeah. Um, you know, they, 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 they perhaps can't get the Pell Grants, uh, right. but they get work, work study possibly, academic yeah. and... Um, and then they have that three, four month period where the, in the summer where they can either go back home or maybe try and work camps or do something to earn some money that they can put towards their tuition and fees for the next season. Yeah. Um, Ramos asked, why is the turnover rate so high in U.S. pro soccer? Um, well, you know, you look at boys out of college and you see them coming. I don't know if he's talking about the college players, but when the college players get signed and turn pro, um, I think it's difficult. You know, that's the knock on college soccer. At the age of 22, are you going to be good enough to right. compete with that 18-year-old who spent four years at the pro level, probably playing on the reserves, under 23 league? A few do get to the first team, but they're yeah. training regularly with the first team players and being in a professional environment. So it's very difficult for the college players to make it. So you get drafted, you get signed, and then three weeks later, you get... We talked about Luther, uh, Lucas Stouffer, you know, he went here and then he went there. And then, you know, so it's great to be uh, drafted, but are you going to make it? You've got to compete with better players. And that's a little bit of the knock on the college game is, are they preparing them to compete at the age of 22 with the first team? Can you play for yeah. the first team or can you get some meaningful minutes right out of college? That's difficult. Yeah, I mean... Um... Well, before I answer the next question, I think, you know, obviously talking, I have, I obviously have friends who've been drafted. I know the draft process, all that stuff. I think it's almost, if if you're not one of those top, top picks, if you're not a Matt Poster, if you're not one of those guys who, you know, 
a lot of people didn't think he was going to make it. I obviously knew him, so I knew like he would make it. I knew he had the ability to adapt. He yeah. had the he, phys he had the physique. He had the you know the technical, the mental. So I knew he was going to do well. But if you're not that kind of player, for me, I think it was almost a blessing that I wasn't drafted. Mm -hmm. I mean, you you look at these players, yeah. like Stoffer, who got let go a little late, struggled to find a team for a little bit. Luckily, got in with New York Red Bulls too. Right. But I know of players who've get who've gotten drafted, played the whole preseason, did well, got let go right at the end, and could not find a team because everyone's um, everyone's rosters were already filled. So, you know, people look at it as you know you're getting drafted, boom, he's on the team. But yeah. like me and me and Stoffer were saying, is like, hey, that's just that just means you got a tryout. That just means you got yeah. the opportunity to go and train. And I mean, it's just a training exercise, basically. Well, for I think you to make it. Yeah, no, that's a very good point, Andrew. I think uh, if I look at yourself, you know, I think the fact that you went USL, I think it's yeah. probably better to get to the USL and work your way up. Yeah. So can you get to the top USL? And then if you're doing well, and sometimes you play against um, younger players of MLS clubs yeah. during the season and show your worth there, they could easily pluck a 28-year-old boy, 27-year-old who's still got five, six years left from a USL team yeah. into an MLS team because you've had genuine playing time. It's like the pros. It's like, you know, uh, David Beckham at Manchester United yeah. early went to Preston, Preston yeah. out on loan, you know, and got meaningful minutes rather than just being a youth player playing 10 minutes here, 20 minutes there in a League Cup game. He got meaningful minutes at a lower level where physically it was probably tougher. Uh, I'd say the same here. You know, you, you they let you go. What? If you were in MLS and they sort of farmed you out, okay, that's one thing. But yeah. like you say, they don't do that. They just let you go. Right. And you got to find another club. But if you went straight to a USL club and made that and were one of the starters and got meaningful minutes and, yeah. and progressed that way, you might eventually make an MLS. Not at 22, 23, 24, but still, you know, yeah. into your mid to late 20s because you prove yourself over three or four years at the USL level. Yeah. And... uh Quick little question. Someone asked, why Why do they call you the gaffer? Well, um, it's an endearing term, you know, from in England. You know, I mean, I remember coming over here and people calling me coach and I would just say player, you know. I mean, I, yeah, I yeah. Wasn't, you know, they called me Bob and, you know, they used to actually call me in the, in Florida the, the governor. One, one yeah. coach who recently died, a terrific coach, CP, he just called me governor and it sort of stuck with other coaches and then players said all right governor you know and I kind of like that although Paul Ince was called the governor and yeah he thought he was a bit too of a big head and you know didn't like that but uh, you know so but the gaffer is an endearing term for a coach yeah. you know yeah. we don't, they don't back home they won't say to Fergie you're a coach or Pep you know it's gaffer and it's just an endearing boss. friendly team boss yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, so it stuck with me a little bit, but Governor was the one that stuck because uh, a fellow coach decided to call me Governor, and uh, that's what they do in England, you know. But it, it's they're not used to calling people coach. I, right. I respect the fact that they call me coach. I allow it. It's not yeah, problem. yeah, true. But at first, I was wow, he's calling me coach. Yeah, that's not you know, um, Mr. Moulin, Coach Moulin. I thought, yeah. well, that's, that's nice. But again, going back to what I said before, I've got to earn your respect. Yeah, um, and I hope I will do. But go ahead and call me Coach Moulin. That's not a problem. I mean, in uh, I mean, when I was in England with Chef Wednesday, they would call him Sean, Sean, Sean. They wouldn't even call him Coach. So when you say yeah. like, when someone says Coach, it's like, oh, I mean, we don't really say that here. Yeah. But uh, yeah, well, yeah. It's when they call me Coach, I say, no, I think we're just traveling by bus today, son. We don't yeah. really get on the coach, you know. I remember, I remember, um, I remember a little story. We were playing against uh, Birmingham, Birmingham City, and we we were getting on the coach. And I went on the wrong side. I went to go to the door because the door is on the opposite side in England. So I went around. I went in and I was like, oh, it's on the other side. But, yeah. um, yeah. Yeah. Would you, um, yeah, why do you support United if Barcelona is the best club in the world? Who is that? Who is that boy? I don't, I don't, I, forget, I don't remember who it was. He told us last time. Last time we yeah. were in the chat, he told us, but forgot who it well, was. All right. This is what I'd ask you. Which which league does he think is better, the Premier League or La Liga? Which is which is the better league? Alex Hernandez. 
Oh, oh, Alex. Well, he's a big time Barcelona fan. Yeah, he yeah. Still emails me. He was a Shattuck boy, and he still emails me when United lose big games and Barcelona <laughs> win. So we a lot, have, of email, a lot of emails, huh? You know, and it's funny, really, because we started that when I was recruiting him. You know, mm. I found he was a Barcelona fan, and so recruiting him. He's a boy from Chicago now at college. Um, you know, so you know, and I tell you, he. He really improved and did very, very well as, as a sure. defender later on in his senior year. Terrific, terrific. Um, but, you know, we always have these, you know, yes, Messi's brilliant and that kind of stuff. But where yeah. would Barcelona finish in a Liga? He probably thinks they'd win it. But In Prem, in the Prem. In the, in the Premiership, you can play the 20th team, the 18th team. We lost to Watford recently and we were fourth or fifth. So sometimes, you know, what about Liverpool? Liverpool, nothing. Watford, three. Now, what about yeah. that score? Liverpool are running. I've only lost one. Liverpool game. beat Barcelona. They beat Barcelona. You know, true. That's true. And then Watford, and then Watford beat Liverpool. You don't see, yeah. you right. don't see um, yeah. Getafe putting three past Barcelona after they just beat Liverpool, made yeah. it to the final. Yeah. Um, and then here's here's the last question is, and I mean I I've I've talked about this multiple times, but I guess he wants to get your idea. Higher level program with no playing time or lower level and starter. And that, that's a no-brainer, I think. Yeah, you've got to play, haven't you? But, the, well, the thing, the thing is, you know, now, how good are you? Because right. the trouble is at colleges, coaches are forced to get more than 20 players, 25, 26. They need those players. And yeah. if you're not going to play, I think the fallacy is, oh, but I'm training with good players. And that, right. that's great. But if you can't take advantage of the spring, where probably you'll get a little bit of playing time in the five games that you can play, yeah. and you never play a game, you know, what are you going to say? Oh, I was on this squad and we won the, right. we got into the semifinals of the playoffs. Right. But you never played. Right. You know, um, you know, at the end of the day, just remind yourself when you started playing at four, five, six, why did you play? You enjoyed it. You loved it. You were playing all the time. You couldn't get off the field. You know, um, I, I'll let, it's a little bit more here, I think, in this country about sub. You know, when I people said sub, I said no, I wasn't hungry. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need a sub, thank you. I, yeah. I, I'm not hungry. No, no, coach, about sub. I mean, people always remind me. It drives me crazy when they're subbing in and out. Yeah, yeah. Just the playing time. They're just not getting enough playing time. And that's why I like the academy, where you've got to start one an average of one in four games. Why not finish with your strongest team? Traditionally, right. you just sub at the end and give him a little bit of time. Yes, the better players deserve more time and will get more time. For sure. But you've got to develop. And if you're not playing at all, how are you developing? You can't just say, well, I trained with them. Because, you know, day before a game, you don't train as much. The day after a game is recovery. Yep. When are you getting better? How are you getting better? And how yep. can you enjoy just being on the bench? Um, I remember at Flagler, you know, we got there early one day to a game. I don't know if I saw it, said this last time, but we got early. So I said to the boys, uh -huh. um, you know, just look around the field before we go and change during an away game, guys. Just take a stroll. And some people went to the goal mouth, the goal is. And some people went here and wing. And one guy just ignored me and just kept, went straight over the field and sat on the bench. I says, son, I said to you, go, coach, this is where I'll be for the next 90 minutes. So I thought I'd get used to the bench. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, you want to play. You want to play. Um, I think... What was I going to say on that? Um, I was basically going to say, like, um, someone said, you sound just like your son. Because, um, I, I mean, that's literally what I say. is like, at the end of the day, why are you playing the game? Are you playing the game to sit on the bench and wear the, the kit? Or are you there to, you know, play the game, play? But um, what I was going to say, that, that makes me, that reminds me of J.J. Watt, who did the opposite. And, you know, obviously now he's a big-time fo football player. But he went to, I think, Western Michigan, who's obviously not a, not a great football team. And basically he went there and realized, hey, I'm not, I'm not going to go to the NFL from Western Michigan. So he walked on at Wisconsin, who was at the time one of the best and still is one of the best teams. And he basically said, you know, I know I'm good enough to make it here. He went from practice squad, like the last on the practice squad, to obviously being a starter. And now he – and now he – um. Now he, he's one of the only um, defensive ends who's had 20 sacks in consecutive seasons. So, yeah. so that's the opposite of, hey, yeah. I'm not going to play this season, but I know I'm good enough to make it, and I'm going to make yeah. it through. So it's, yeah. just about, it's just about knowing yourself yeah. and knowing yourself as a player. Yeah. 
yeah some of my best success stories you know at college for instance were people that walked on you know i didn't recruit them they didn't play much first year <clears throat> and then just you know proved over the next year or two some maybe only played in their last two years junior and senior and struggled as a freshman and a sophomore but they kept going right. kept going and you never know when your opportunity might come and they took it but they were working hard and pushing mm -hmm. themselves but you don't want to do that for four years because you want to play so you've got to know the level and you've got to say okay i might he's not recruiting me or i might not be good enough right now but i'm going to prove that i believe in myself and i'm going to yeah. get there in the end as and some of i look at some of the players Yes, I recruited them and they maybe started as a freshman and went all four years as a starter. It right. got better and better. But some success stories were kids that didn't start, got a bit of minutes, got a bit of minutes, and then junior started, yeah. senior, breakout season and finished yeah. so strong where they started, you know, not playing much. And, and, and I look at that uh, and that prepares you for life. You know, you're not getting yeah. exactly your way in the beginning, but you've got to push. You don't give up. You don't quit. You've decided you want to do this, so yeah. But you know, it's no good. Some players who aren't quite good enough go to the national champions and want to walk on here and want to walk on there. Well, that's difficult. So you got I to think, know the level. I think that's two twofold for me because you know I talk about John Burner. He came in and basically went his first three years. Obviously, redshirted one year, but when his first three years didn't play a minute, mm -hmm. then his senior, um, then his senior, and then you know, fifth year, he played every minute, ended up getting drafted. So, right. I mean, for goalkeepers, obviously, it's different. Like, right. you can have one great year and be a, be a top five draft pick. So, right. it's, it's a little bit different for them. But like, like we were saying, like, he just rode the bench for three years, finished his last two years strong. I mean, how strong is, how strong is the MVC uh, for second round, getting, getting out in the second round? I don't know how strong that is, but, you know, Congrats, John. But, but also, and then you have the flip side as well of someone like myself who started every game as a freshman, started every game as a sophomore, and then then started not playing junior and senior year. Mm -hmm. So that's a like that's not something that people normally do. So I was in uncharted territory where, hey, now I need to figure out what I'm going to do here. Yeah, but you finished in your senior year very strong, didn't you? That was the key. I mean, yeah. you were, you know, you were one of the top players. I thought second half of the yeah. season, senior For year. Sure. You know, uh, Proved your point to the coach. For sure. But, um, yeah, we're about to get kicked off here in two minutes. Um, What's that question? Did anybody ever tell me what? He said, Andrew, did anyone ever tell you you look like Danny Carvajal? Oh. I'm you know what I'm going to do after this? I'm going to post a lookalike photo, and we're going to see what, what people think. But um, uh, we'll be proud if you see my eating habits now. Hey, congrats. Hernandez, he said, "You'd be proud of my eating habits now, not eating the not eating the fries in the dining hall." That's right. I always told him, "You don't need the fries. You got a game Saturday, son. Come on." Yeah. All right. Well, we're about to get kicked off. Oh, excellent. Um, pleasure. I appreciate it. We'll obviously do it again. Great talks. My pleasure. All right. Bye. Bye. Guys, thank you so much for being on the IG live. I really appreciate it, Charles. Hernandez, Ramos, of course, Inez. Thank you guys so much for being on. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Um, I left the the thing on the bottom, my free webinar replay. I went over some film study, some things that I do to, to go through film and then apply it to my game and how I, I've taken my game, you know, from freshman in high school all the way up to obviously now I'm a pro for four years. So the webinar, link in the bio. Go check it out. Um, appreciate it. And you'll get access to all my free stuff. Uh, a lot of free stuff. Something coming out every week. Something free. I'm giving it all away, guys. And uh, I appreciate you guys so, so much. And um, yes, I need, can't wait to see that pick. Yeah, you are the first one. <laughs> my, sister, my sister Ani said I don't look like him. All right, guys. And gals, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Make sure you're you're checking the link in the bio if you're not already subscribed. Appreciate you guys, and uh, we'll talk to you tomorrow. Always questions in the DMs. I'm I'm answering them every single day before bed. So make sure you're getting in the DMs, guys. Make sure you're getting in the DMs. Love you guys. Peace.
So my son uh, plays at Feyenoord. He played against uh, um, Ajax under 14. He was on the bench. He didn't play. So uh, in the car on the way back, he was like a bit moody, disappointed, complaining a little bit about uh, others, about the coach, etc. And then I said, yeah. I said, but Shaquille, I said, you sound like a loser, you know, if you talk like this in a way, you sound like you lost. I said, you are blaming him, you're blaming her, you're blaming this, you're blaming everything. I said, but I don't hear one single thing about yourself. I said, winners, I said, they take control and they blame themselves and they look where they can improve. Yeah. And um, um, this is what you should be thinking about. So I didn't tell him uh, what he should think about. You should ask yourself the question, are you a loser or are you a winner? So my son uh, plays at Feyenoord. He played against uh, um, Ajax under 14. He was on the bench. He didn't play. So uh, in the car on the way back, he was like a bit moody, disappointed, complaining a little bit about uh, others, about the coach, etc. And then I said, yeah, I said, but Shaquille, I said, you sound like a loser, you know, if you talk like this in a way, you sound like you lost. I said, you are blaming him, you're blaming her, you're blaming this, you're blaming everything. I said, but I don't hear one single thing about yourself. I said, winners, I said, they take control.